Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the third talk of the 3D geometry vision seminar series online. So today is our great honor to have uh, uh, Dr. Xin Tong from Microsoft Research Asia. Uh, Dr. Tong is uh, right now is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research Asia, the Internet Graphics uh, Division. So he he is actually uh, to the uh, to the to uh, I think don't need the introduction. Okay, so but briefly, uh, Dr. Tong uh, has uh, contributed a lot to to graphics vision and recently to machine learning. Um, so uh, today he will talk about learning the space of 3D shapes, some challenges, and our explorations. Welcome. OK, yeah, thanks, uh, Qixing, for the kind introduction. And it is my great pleasure to be here to introduce our work on the 3D deep learning. So as uh, Qixing mentioned, today I'm going to talk about some challenges in the 3D shape space learning and our recent work in this area. So, so our real world is composed of the variant 3D shapes there. So in computer graphics and computer vision, so each individual 3D shape can be represented by its boundary surface or other forms there, which we always define the 3D shape uh, or the surface as a 2D manifold in the 3D space. Actually, this, uh, this 3D shapes or the shape modeling is a cornerstone of the computer graphics and computer vision. And for many, many organic objects that share the similar geometry or the, if we look at the man-made shapes designed for the specific functions, such as the human body, human faces, as well as the uh, airplanes shown here, all the shapes in the same category may form a low dimensional shape subspace in the high dimensional space spanned by the, all the possible object shapes there. So we call it the 3D shape space. Uh, if we gather all the 3D shapes in one class there and uh, the subspace formed by this 3D shape collections, we call it the 3D shape space. Yeah. So modeling and capture individual 3D shapes are classic research topics in the computer graphics and computer vision. So to this end, researchers have developed a set of algorithms and tools for this purpose in the past decades. However, the techniques for modeling and constructing 3D shape space is not well explored. And if you look at the before the deep learning area, before for specific shape class, such as the human face or bodies, and some parametric models have been constructed from the aligned 3D shape data set. For buildings or trees, also the researchers developed some dedicated procedural modeling techniques for each kind of such objects here, yeah. With the recent development of the deep learning and the availability of the 3D shape data sets such as the ShapeNet, deep learning methods have been widely used for learning the shape space from the 3D shape collections. So compared to the traditional techniques dedicated for specific object class, the deep learning methods not only provide a unified solution for encoding shapes in one class, but also offer very strong encoding capability where the deep nonlinear neural net works there. Compare, if we compare this with the traditional tensor or linear model for the human face or bodies there, yeah. And on one hand, the learned shape space plays a very important role in many graphics and vision tasks. In shape completion and reconstruction, the learned shape space acts as a prior to map the single image or incomplete noisy 3D scan to the complete 3D shapes there. In the 3D analysis tasks, the learned shape space offers efficient features for different downstream shape analysis tasks such as uh, shape classification, shape segmentation, and shape matching. For geometry modeling, the learned shape space is also used for 3D shape generation. And if you look at the recently uh, SIGGRAPH 
OCVPR, ICCV vision conference papers and uh, CEQA papers, you can see a lot of works in these areas. But on the other hand, if we look at the learning shape space, we think it's still not an easy task due to several challenges we think. First, and many shape classes exhibit very large shape variations and there are no correspondence between the different shapes. So if we look at the traditional shape space learning tasks, such as if we want to build a parametric model for the human face or bodies, always the first thing we need to do is we need to align the scanned 3D face or bodies, which will align the different geometry features, corresponding geometry features together, and then we'll greatly reduce the complexity of the model construction. However, for many shape classes, such as the chairs shown on the right, the shape variation is large and it is very difficult to construct dense correspondence between the different shapes there. Even we ask people to label such correspondence is a very difficult task. And secondly, if we closely look at the shapes in a class, such as the chairs shown here, we can see that different from the human face or bodies that always share the same structure or topology. These shapes have continuous, both continuous geometry variations and discrete structure variations there. Moreover, the structure of 3D shapes is also unknown, although the people perception can easily say these structures, but we don't know how to get it. The hybrid is discrete structural variations and the continuous geometry variations makes the learning task even more difficult compared to the image or the video sphere. And finally, compared to the 2D image or the video such as the image sequence, capturing or modeling the 3D shapes and their dynamics is still a very difficult task. Currently, all the image sensors are still the 2D sensors. So to obtain a complete 3D models, we need to scan an object from different viewpoints. Then you need to fuse the, all the scans together and do some denoising, and then finally got the complete 3D shapes. So as a result, compared to the image data set that always contains millions of the images, and the 3D data set has much less data there. And moreover, and the labeling 3D data where the 2D UI is more difficult to learn, uh, learn the image labeling or the video labeling tasks there. So people need to, or, or the researchers need to develop a smarter way for learning the 3D shape space from a relatively small amount of the data samples here. Yeah, that's also one challenge here. So in the past several years, the researchers have developed many deep learning techniques to tackle these three challenges and re greatly advance the state of the art in 3D shape learning. So in the following part of my talk, I will discuss some existing solutions and our efforts along each direction. So for the first challenge of the shape variation and the missing correspondence, people proposed many different representations of the 3D shapes for deep learning. All these representations can accurately represent each individual 3D shapes here. And moreover, when we define, when we define or, or fix a representation for the 3D shapes, you also implicitly define the correspondence between the different shapes. For example, when you use an implicit function to represent a 3D shape using the volumetric implicit functions, or implicit field to represent 3D shapes. Then the two, two 2D shapes can build their correspondence with their function values at the same spatial positions. So in each X, Y, Z, same position in the same spatial positions and the, the 2D two function values of the two 3D shapes, you can do the interpolation and you can say they build this correspondence there. And for multiple image representations, for example, another example, the pixel correspondence between the two projected 3D shapes define their correspondence 
they will be aligned and sent to the deep neural network to learn the features there. And you can do the convolutions for the image there. So for the atlas and template-based representation, and these methods take, a, take a, another way and they, they just define, predefine a set of template or atlas layer and use these templates to fit the different three shapes where the self-supervised learning. So in this, in this approach, the network try to simultaneously learn the shape space and explicit correspondence between the different shapes here. So when you map all the 3D shapes to the same template, then you build the correspondence layer. And despite, despite these many, many representations and of advanced techniques there, if you look at current all the 3D deep learning models there, and none of them still cannot faithfully encode all the 3D shapes in a class, which means when you encode the shapes there and do the decoding, there are some details missing or some part of missing. And if you use the latent code to generate the different 3D shapes, still, and the shapes missing some features or, or geometry features or some details there. Yeah. So the question here is that, can we find a better underlying shapes representations for the shape space learning? So that we hope that that representations can better encoding or, or implicitly encode the, the geometry coherence of or the coherence of the different 3D shapes in the class. Yeah. So to this end, we work with uh, Xiaoguang Han and Kui Jia's team and developer a significant bridged learning approach for generating mesh given the to complex topology from single images. The paper is published in the CAPR 2019. So the basic idea here is that we want to develop an efficient method for re reconstruct or encode 3D shapes with complex topology here. So the key idea here is that we found all the ex existing method before our approach, they cannot preserve both the shape geometry details and shape topology for especially for the scene structures there. So we just want to say whether we can develop some representations so that based on that representation, we can learn network so that both the geometry and the topology, especially for the scene structure can be preserved. And also this, this representation can be easily learned from the existing data set and can serve for the 3D reconstruction for different 3D reconstruction tasks, such as the 3D reconstruction from the single image. That's exactly the, 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 the task we demonstrate in our paper. And this work is mainly done in the Xiaoguang Han and Kui Jia's lab there. I just want to mention, yeah. So our key observation is that to preserve the whole encode the shape topology, actually the skeleton may be a very good representation for this one. And the skeleton always or the, uh, is extracted from the surface by sinking the surface point along the reverse direction of the normal vectors. So you can, you can imagine that you just uh, shrink the surface to the central part and finally you got this, uh, you got this skeletons. And if you look at the skeletons of the many shapes, it composed of the two parts. One part is some curves here and for some cylinder like the shapes components here. And also for some uh, thin, thin uh, plans like scenes there, you will got some sheets there and you can represent as uh, some plans there. Yeah, so, so those skeletons will well preserve the topologies there and also they will just uh, reduce or simplify a lot of geometry variations of different shapes there. So if we just learn this skeleton instead of the shapes layer, we can lower the learning complexity for the topology properties of the 3D shapes here. So based on this skeleton, we develop a hybrid hierarchical representation for the 3D shapes. So the first, we just use this skeleton structure to preserve in the shape topology and each shape is first pre pre represented by the skeleton and composed of a set of lines and sheets there. And then we use a 3D volume to model the overall 3D shapes 
and this volume is uh, is 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 uh, is grows from the skeleton layer, and after that, this three volume still cannot model all the surface details. So we also add another representation of the three D mesh for the shape details. So each three D shape will represent by the skeleton and rough three D volume and a 3D detailed 3D mesh there. We use this hybrid representation to represent each 3D shapes. So given this hybrid representations, we develop a 3D three-stage learning for the single image to the 3D shapes. But of course, you can also encode the 3D shape and doing the autoencoder from the 3D shape to 3D shape. Here in the paper, we just try to encode a single image of the 3D shape to the final 3D output shapes there. So the first stage will encode the image to some skeletal points on both the lines and the, 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 the sheets there. And, and then the second step will we first will convert these skeleton points to some rough volume. And then the second stage will learn this skeleton volume to the final three rough 3D volume layer. And the last stage, we will convert the volume to a surface mesh and then learn a volume to the detailed mesh layer. And so if we look at the data stream layer, we will first, first step, we will do the point regression. And then the second step, we will regress the volume uh, using volume CNN to to, to just encode the 3D volume layer. And the last step, we will graph CNN to operate it on 3D mesh to obtain the mesh details there. And, uh, and, uh, and this is uh, from also from the cost to fun and from the structure, skeleton structure to the surface details there. And uh, in, in, in the paper implementations, we just uh, do some supervision in each stage and we train each stage step by step. Uh, country, but also you 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 can also train this from end to end. But in the paper, we don't do this. We do this separately for each step, and then we we can calculate all the three steps and got this end-to-end uh, -end pipeline. And given the input image in the inference stage, given the input image, we will output the final three D detailed mesh. And here we just show some uh, some visual comparisons. And given the input image shown on the left, and uh, we show the, the, the 3D output and uh, uh, performed by the different approaches. And you can see that compare all the other existing method layer, our method can generate the better result, especially for the scene structures, we can preserve the details and well, well, well reconstruct all these uh, scene structures layer compared to the ground truth show on the rightmost, yeah. And we, we also do some numerical representations, uh, comparisons here, you can say here, and we compare our result with the ground truth under, under both the chamfer distance metric and the earth moose distance matrix there. And in all these approaches, you can say that our method almost achieve the state of art performance for almost all the all the category, uh, shape category, and uh, and especially for the shapes with the, with the thin structures there, such as chairs, yeah, and tables there. And here we just show some result and doing the three D reconstruction from the single real image here. And for comparison, we also on the left side we show the so the result generated by the atlas net on the bottom left. On the bottom right is the result generated by ours. On the, on the left is the, is the result of is the input image of the real image. We also use the segmentation uh, uh, to gather mask layer and we, we, we mask out the, this uh, image part and use as our input here. And you can see that compared to the atlas net result, our result can preserve a lot of scene structure details here. And here we do some uh, ablation study and show that the skeleton inference stage is really important for our 
result and for our network. So on the for the left input image here, the result show in column B is a result done by the octree based generation network without the skeleton inference stage. You can see here and some structures are not well preserved and some thin structures are missing here on the chair. And uh, the, the column C is our result generated by our full pipeline here with the skeleton inference stage. And the D is the ground truth result here. Yeah. Yeah. So here is the result is, uh, is our effort to try say whether we can develop some hybrid representations and can well present different properties of the 3D shapes layer so that we can easy the machine shape space learning tasks layer so that the network result network can better encode the different shape details, different properties such as topology layer and can generate a better result layer. Yeah. So for the second thing about the structure and geometry variations of the 3D shapes layer, and uh, you can see that there are a lot of works have been done to learning the shape structures here. And uh, there are some supervised method layer. And uh, if you give some labeled 3D structures layer, then there are a lot of approach can try to learn the 3D structures or do the uh, semantic segmentations of 3D shapes based on this labeled data. And also recently there are some a lot of works and provide very, 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 very good and the structure information of the data using some data set provide some benchmark data set has a path pattern night done by the house lab by Moore at all and the last year and also another data set by the Kai Xu's team uh, on uh, the, the, the old name as the part night provide such structure information there. And also there are some efforts there to try to learn this structure information from the data set and label the data set using unsupervised way. The seminal work is from the to 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 Sani is from also from the Hausu team in the 2017. It tried to learn the shape abstractions from the shape data set, unlabeled data set in the unsupervised way. And recently in this year, there are also some work to use the unsupervised approach to learn these shape structures. So if we look at as some big effort about the part night work here, and uh, and we can see layer, and although there are some existing work for the unsupervised learning layer, and all these existing works, the problem is that it's very difficult. They can learn some consistent shape structures among the different shapes in a class. However, they are difficult to learn the shape variations, especially those detailed structure variations of the 3D shapes layer using the unsupervised way. And if you have some labeled data set, it's relatively easy for you to learn the shape structures using the supervisor approach. However, the problem is that the label the shape structure actually is really labor intensive work. It's not an easy task. If you look at the work in the part night, you can say yes. So the question here is that how can we learn the shape structures from the unlabeled shape collections? Is this possible? And to answer these questions, and the last year we, we, we tried to develop some learning uh, work, try to learn the good abstraction of the 3D shapes in a class using the unsupervised learning. So, so our, our goal is to try to efficiently model the consistent shape structures of the different shapes layer without any data labeling. And at the same time, we hope that our approach can well handle structure variations of different shapes. So the input of our approach is a set of the unlabeled 3D shapes shown on the left. So our approach will automatically try to learn some shape structures or shape abstractions there. So the result is a set of consistent shape abstractions represented by a set of box shown on the right. You can see that for different structures, Shape with different structures, our approach can generate really good result here. And the work has been published in the last year, SIGWAP Asia. Yeah. So we talk about our goal is to try to construct a good 3D shape abstractions or shape structures here. So then the question will be, 
what do, do we mean a good shape three D abstractions here? So specifically, we think a good shape abstraction or the three D shape structure representations should meet such properties shown below. The first thing is that it should be very, very compact, which means we want to use as few as possible primitives to abstract a 3D shapes here, as shown here. And secondly, we hope that the abstraction should be very expressive so that it can abstract 3D shapes with the different structures here. And, uh, and uh, as shown here for different airplanes with different components there, we hope that our abstra shape abstractions can represent all these structure variations here. And thirdly, the abstraction should be adapt ad adaptive because if you look at the different part of 3D shapes, they may exhibit a different level of structure details here. So that we hope that they can represent both the large components and abstract structures. And also for some part, they can also represent those detailed structure variations and detailed structures there. And finally, the structure of the primitives should be consistent among the different shapes there. So it can be easily reviewed the common structure and substructure shared by the different objects as shown here for the two airplanes. They can show, they can show the consistent abstractions and show the consistent structures there and also for the tails, they can show the structure variations as well. Yeah. So to achieve this goal, which means we need to develop a good 3D structure representations or shape abstraction representations. So to this end, our key observation here is that will the 3D object in the class have various structures? They share a common structure at a higher abstraction levels. For example, the 3D three airplanes here have different structure details, but they are all composed of one single airframe, one tail, and two wings here. They, they have some common structures. Our second key observation is that different shapes may exhibit various structure details in different abstraction levels. For example, the tail of the airplane have more fine green structures than the airframe, which means for different component and they may have different level of the structures. Yeah. So based on these two key observations, we propose this adaptive hierarchical qubit representations. And on the left, is the input of the 3D shape. And in the middle is the hierarchical structure of the abstraction. And on the right is adaptive hierarchical qubit representation. We want to capture as much as possible structure details on multiple levels and get a coherent abstraction at a higher level. So you can see here is the hierarchical structure and here is the adaptive hierarchical qubit representations. When we, when we choose the different uh, components as the different levels, we compose the final adaptive hierarchical qubit representations here. So specifically, a qubit is parametrized as a unit cube centered at the original point under a rigid transformation. So we use a set of qubits to abstract a 3D shape. The union of the qubits should compactly over cover the input 3D shape. And each qubit is expected to represent a unique part of the 3D shapes here. Yeah. Then we introduce hierarchy to the qubit abstractions. For good 3D abstractions, the number of qubits should vary according to the complexity of the input 3D shapes. However, too few cubics cannot capture small detail shape details, and too many cubics might yield an overall decomposition. So for a good hierarchy abstractions, each level should be a good approximation to the input 3D shape. The part approximated by the children cubic 
can also be approximate by their parent cube cuboid. So by adaptively picking the qubit from the hierarchy, we get adaptive qubit abstractions. The union of the qubit qubit we picked is also a good approximation with as few as possible cuboid. Each level of the abstraction is also a good approximation to the input 3D shapes here. So given this hierarchy adaptive qubit representation as a target, we need to learn a network to construct this representation from the unlabeled 3D shape data. To this, for this purpose, we also need to tackle several challenges. For given 3D shapes, we don't know how many 3D qubits should, should we use. And how, what hierarchy should abstraction follows? And finally, how to optimize the parameters of the qubit, their size, their transformations, and their positions, and their, their poles here. Yeah. So how to generate this representation from unlabeled 3D shape data? And we, we to tackle these challenges, we develop our solutions shown here. So to answer the first question is how to determine the number of qubits for each shape is unknown. We try to first learn a multi-level qubit representation with redundant but fixed number of qubits in each level. So we first get a, a multi-level representation of the qubit representations. And in each level, we provide enough number of qubits so that this representation might be redundant for, for, for each shapes. Learn to gauge this adaptive hierarchy of the qubit for each shape, we try to learn another tree selection network to guide adaptive hierarchy qubit for each shape from this multi-level representations there. And to gauge the parameters of the qubit for each shape there, we use a shape approximate error for supervision so that we need any label information. So we just use the shape itself as a and as a loss functions, based, uh, based on that, we develop some loss functions for it. So based on these key ideas, we propose our solution is a unsupervised learning method. It consists of three components. So given a input 3D shapes, we use a shape encoder network to get latent code. Learn the qubit prediction module, just decodes the latent code to three levels of the qubit abstraction with the hierarchy structures there. Next, the qubit selection model predicts the three level of the selection masks represented by the binary signals. And using the selection masks, a set of qubits are picked from the hierarchy to form the adaptive qubit abstractions. And during the training, we update the qubit prediction and the selection module iteratively to refine the masks and the qubit parameters there. And finally, we get a good adaptive qubit abstraction of the input 3D shapes there. That's our basic pipeline here. So to this end, for each branch, we also develop or design a set of loss functions. For the qubit prediction model, we try to uh, develop qubit abstractions to approximate 3D errors, to approximate input 3D shifts there. So we develop some volume coverage loss, surface coverage loss, to make sure that the qubit abstraction can well approximate original geometry with both the volume coverage and surface coverage the mutex loss to make sure that the qubit will not overlap with each other and to, to avoid some, some, some EO, EO solutions. And the hierarchical loss just to make sure we build some hierarchical relationship, hierarchical relationships between the different levels there. And uh, for the qubit selection module, we also develop some loss about the tree completion loss, mass, mass capacity loss, and approximation loss. So tree completion loss makes sure that when we choose 
the qubit at different levels, we got a tree structure sphere so that all the component, all the part of the different of the three shapes should be covered. And the mask sparsity laws make sure that we just choose as few as possible qubits there to cover the 3D shapes. And the approximation loss just balance the sparsity loss to make sure that we still got a good approximation of the input 3D shapes. For the detail of low all these loss functions, please refer to our paper for low, those details there. And we, we have implement our uh, network training for on the TensorFlow with the TensorFlow framework. And we train our network with batch size 32 and using the 1000 apples for initial training and 200 apples for each iterative training steps there. And uh, we, we, we test our uh, method on the airplane chair table from ShapeNet and animal from the uh, Chusani uh, previous work of the Chusani's previous work there. And uh, for each category, shape category, we train one network. And we use the same loss function width for the four categories. And we show some, some kind of robustness of our loss function width selections there. Yeah. And here we show abstraction result predicted by our network. In each category, the qubit with the same color are the correspondence parts in the different shapes. The body of the airplane is represented by the blue qubit. And the seats of the chair is represented by the red qubit. You can see here. It's an air body, airplane body. And here is a here is a is a chair seat. Here you can see that lately le, le, for different shapes with the different structures, we still can got this consistent shape structures there. And uh, here we, 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 we focus on the chair class. We, we just say that for, for, for chairs with different structures, our approach can also successfully learn the varied structures there. And based on the structures obtained here, we just cluster them by their abstraction structures of the different shapes there. And in the same group, you can see that all the chairs have the same structure, where different groups shows different structures here. And also you can see like that the, the blue qubit represents the air chair back. And the, the green one shows the chair back and the red qubit stand for the chair seat here. And still you can say for the different structures for the shared part, they also, we also preserve the consistency or the correspondence here. And we also compare our result with the work, uh, previous work and the seminal work of the uh, Tusani, and which is also a supervised learning approach for the qubit abstractions. And they use a single level qubit setting and without any hierarchy, their approach cannot well address the structural variations and result in some oversimplified abstractions here. And also due to this oversimplified abstraction, if we compare their approximate approximation error to the angular shape, you can see that our approach also achieves the better shape approximation. And if you say on the left is our uh, shape abstraction results here, we just uh, try to deliver more structure details here compared to the previous work. As shown here. And given our the latest space train our abstraction network, and you can see that encode useful as structure and both structure and the geometry information. So given the two shapes, we first extract their abstraction structure, and we learn we interpret their latent code and get the interpolated structures. Then we use the structure to retrieve a similar shape in the data set and deform the shape by the abstraction to get the final shape here. And then based on that, you can see that we, we generate this uh, interpolation result with the structure. Also, we, we structure not only interpolate the shape details, we also try to interpolate these structures and got some intermediate result and get a good 
interpolation result here. Yeah. And that's the second work on the ship structures. Then let's look at the, 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 the last item is the, how to deal with the difficulty of the data acquisition and the data labeling layer. And, uh, and uh, if you look at here, and uh, you can see here is that, and uh, to, to deal with this difficulty here, people actually in the field in recent years, they try to develop a set of approach, try to learning the 3D shape or shape space directly from the 2D images, which means for this image, for this approach, they don't need any 3D data shape data for the training process. So that this method try to bridge the dimensionality gap between the 3D shape and the 2D images here. So along these directions, there are a lot of work try to develop some differentiable rendering layer so that given the image, you can do using this dif dif differentiable rendering to do the inverse rendering work so that you can recover the shapes or recover the appearance and got the 3D shapes there. There are also for single 3D shapes, there are also some great progress recently and people developed some neural texture or neural volume work. And recently in the ECC, there are some ne ne neural readings field works there. So that they represent the 3D shapes as the implicit functions or rough geometries there. And so that you can directly derive such representations using a neural network from a collection of the images of a single object. For shape collections, and also there are some works parallel or after our works is some thin representation networks published in the NIPS. They try to encoding the 3D shapes using implicit functions, using the fully connected neural networks, MLP. Then for the shape collections, they can train a meta network to, to, to derive the weights of the MLP for each different, for each individual 3D shapes. And also there are some hologram work. They try to learn some 3D implicit 3D representation and the deep render pipeline layer so that they can directly generate the so 3D, 2D images with the different uh, view angles and different posts there automatically. And they learn the whole network from the 2D image collections there. And uh, so the our uh, question here is that how to learn the 3D shape space from the 2D image collections there. And uh, I just mentioned that for, for all these uh, works, Angela works for the shape collections, you can say that for the scene representation network, they need some images of the same object from capture from different viewpoint and the viewpoint should be known. And for image class hologram works, they, they can generate some, learn some shapes representations, implicit shapes representations, and can generate the image for the different viewpoint and different angles. However, they cannot directly give you the 3D explicitly 3D shapes there or they don't give you the, the disentangled 3D representations and uh, learned from the, these 2D image collections. So our question here is that, or our goal here is that how to learn a 3D shape space from the 2D image collections. And towards this goal, and we developed this project. And uh, the goal of this project is to solve the gap between the input 3D image, uh, 2D image and the 3D here, 3D output here. So here we focus on generate 3D shapes from the annotated, annotated and labeled 2D image collections of the object in the same category. For example, we want to generate the 3D birds from a set of bird images. Here, the input is a 2D, currently we use a 2D silhouette of the different kind of bird from the different views. And the object uh, output is a 3D shape of the birds there. So our model, after training, our model can give you the 3D shape of the birds there, yeah. And the work has been published in the last year CVPR, yeah. So if we look at this, uh, this, this problem, it's really a challenge. Just because if we really know for, for, for single 3D object, if we know their image captured from different views, and the traditional 
multi view stereo or the uh, or the traditional 3D reconstruction techniques can can build the 3D reconstruction and uh, and do the reconstruct 3D shapes from those 2D image collections. But here, I think the the the, the problem is that we we don't know any correspondence between the different viewpoints there, which means we don't have multiple view image of one object. For, for, for each object, we may have only image from only from single view or image captured from only one or two views there. And also moreover, the view information of each image is unknown. And finally, the input is set of 2D image and what we obtain, want to obtain is a 3D shapes there. So the task is, uh, is somehow is really challenged. So our key idea here is that we think we can use the apply the GAN or the discreter for these three construction tasks. So the basic idea here is that instead of God, if we have this uh, correspondence between the images, generally we can use the L2 loss for the, for, the, for the reconstruction for the consistency. So here we just use the discreter can be used as aerometric for image shape consistency for each viewpoint which means after we got the 3D shapes, and when we project the 3D shape to some viewpoint, then the discreter can be used to distinguish whether the 3D shape or the project 3D shape is good enough. And for the discreter, we try to coordinate the discreter from different views to maintain the view view consistency. But the problem is that, as we mentioned, we also don't know the view information of each input image, which means we, we, we cannot use this one, this scheme, if we don't have any viewpoint information. Then we realize that the good thing is that if you can train some GAN layer, the synthetic 3D, 3D information or 3D data generated by the GAN actually can be used for the view prediction training here, which means we try to use the 2D image to help the 3D generation GAN training. And on the other hand, after we train some 3D GAN, the 3D data generated by the GAN can be used for the view prediction to help the view predictions here. And based on these key ideas, we develop our solutions. We call it the multiple projection GAN or short name is the MP here. So, 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 so if you look at as shown on the right, we have this uh, one generator of the 3D shapes. So given the latent code, the generator will generate the 3D volume data of the 3D shapes layer. And after that, we have this projection layer to project these 3D shapes according to the given specific given viewpoint, we project it into a set of 2D image or 2D silhouette here. And for each kind of 2D view, view points or view slots layer, we have some dedicated discreters, each for the image with similar views layer. So we have a set of discreters layer. So we call this the multiple projection GAN, which means each 3D shape will be projected to the multiple views. And for each branch, we have dedicated discreters here. And com 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 a com a com combining with these uh, generators here, we also have this view prediction network we call the VP here. So this VP here is that given the input image, this view prediction network will try to give you some viewpoint information of this real input image. So this prediction network is try to predict the view information of the image here. So you can say here that this, uh, for training this one, the generator will generate synthetic training data to train this view prediction network. And after we have this, uh, real prediction network, we can put the real image in and real image in will predict their view, view, viewpoint information and the view input information will be used to classify all the training image into the different view categories there and then use for this multiple projection GAN training there, yeah. So here, this is the basic idea. To train this two network iteratively, we first using the rendering of 3D shapes generated by the multiple projection GAN for the VP training and using the VP to classify the image according to their views and train the GAN with the multi meters 
and each corresponding to image in one class. So at the beginning, we just first put all the image in one category and we don't distinguish their views just because we don't have view information. Then we train the GAN first with all with a single discriminator and all the training image in one category. So after that, we got this initial GAN and we use this initial GAN to generate some 3D shapes. And after we got these 3D shapes, we just render these three shapes with some kind of known viewpoint to guard this silhouette information. And we put this rendered uh, silhouette information, silhouette image with their known view information as the training image to train the view prediction network. And after we got this view prediction network, we put all the real image, their silhouette image to this viewpoint prediction network to got this initial viewpoint information layer. And based on that, we do the viewpoint cluster. So after that, we got the initial view cluster and then we return the view prediction, view multiple projection GAN network with this uh, cluster view image and with the multiple uh, discriminators. Then we repeat this process, refine the view prediction network and refine the multiple projection GAN network and finally, we achieve the final result after convert. So here we compare our result with, uh, with the several existing works. So here is the VE result based on the volumetric input and output, which means for this synthetic data, we, we, we just uh, use the 3D volume uh, uh, of the ground truth data to train this VE and the 3D GAN. So you can see here, here is our upper bound, which means we, when, we, when we use a 2D silhouette image to train this multi-projection GAN, I think at most we can achieve the same results just based on the same representation, volumetric representations and similar GAN structures there. And here you generate by the previous work, they don't, they just train this volumetric representation with all the image without a distinguished layer, layer, layer viewpoint and only use a single discriminators. And here is our result. We trained with our view prediction and the multi projection GAN information here. So you can see that our result definitely is better than the, 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 the network trained with a single discriminator. And compared to the 3D GAN, the result looks similar, but still a little bit inference with that, but still can reveal a lot of geometry details and the structures here. Yeah. And we also try to train the network with some uh, real image here. For the real image, we also use the automatic uh, image segmentation algorithm to obtain the, the object silhouette for each real image input. And after that, we train our network with the real image collections for the bird image and also for a, a collection of the real chair image there. And you can see that our generation result for the 3D models, we can really reproduce the different 3D models or different shape variations of the bird here. And also for the chairs, we can generate the chairs with the different structures. And also very interesting, some structures can be well reproduced here. And, and as a result, I think it's really promising, but just because we only use the silhouette information. so a lot of shape details cannot be well reproduced. Yeah. So to summarize uh, my talk, so we just introduced that, we just discussed about the uh, shape, learning shape space there. I think that we all agree that learning the shape space is very important, yet still challenging the task in the graphics and vision tasks, just due to several challenges, such as the rich geometry and topology variations of 3D objects, and the discrete uh, structural variations of 3D shapes. And also it suffer from the insufficient amount of the data. And we just introduced several works of uh, our explorations along each directions. But I think uh, our work still has a lot of limitations for skeleton bridge method. And when we train the skeleton, we still need the labeled data for training, which means we first need some using some existing algorithm to generate the skeleton of the 3D shapes 
Then we use that scattered data for the supervised training for the first stage of our network. For the unsupervised shape abstraction approach, although our method can recover some shape structure information and get good shape abstractions for different shape class. However, just because we only use the geometry information layer for some shapes with very more complex structures with small components layer, or they have some overlapped parts layer, such as cars. And this shapes and supervised shape abstraction method cannot generate good structure decomposition that consistent with the semantic structure information, such as cars. For car 3D shapes, it's so difficult for us to, to generate the qubit for the wheels and car bodies separately. And just because there's a lot of car wheels, their, their, their bounding box will overlap with the car body part. So it's so difficult for us to, to, to separate it from the car bodies. And also for, for some uh, uh, shape classes with very small components layer, and it's so difficult for us to generate a separate box for, for that small components layer. That's the limitations. And for the multiple projection gain, although the method is very promising, and currently we only use the silhouette information for this 3D shape generations, and how to use the whole image, full image information, such as the inf shading information inside the image pixels for better shape generation is still a challenging topic here. And uh, if we look forward, I would like to say that uh, although we obtain a good advance of the shape space learning since, it's still very challenging task and uh, we are still on going way and we, we are still in the early stage along these directions. And I think still there are several big challenges here. The first thing definitely is uh, about the data, data, data. As, uh, if you compare with uh, a lot of image tasks in the vision field, I mean, still we don't have the high quality, a large amount of data and for our 3D learning tasks here. And how high quality data acquisition is still a very difficult task for us. And also, if we want to bridge the gap between the image videos and high dimensional graphic data, ship data here, and if we really want to use this image video as the input to train our 3D uh, network or 3D deep learning tasks there, and another necessary task or must necessary technique is disentanglement representations, just because for the input image, they all they will include both the 3D shape information as well as some texture or appearance information here. So we, we, if we really want to only learn the 3D shape information from these image videos, we need some disentanglement representations so that we can de decompose the appearance information from this image and we, we, we can learn, learn the 3D information there. And the, 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 the another question or, 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 or problem is that what's the efficient representation of the network structures for encoding shape space there. And uh, if we look at the image or vision domain layer for, for image tasks there, people have this pre-trained model with the uh, well-known structures, network structures, all the people, or all, all the backbone structures, people all agreed and it may, will be used for different tasks. But for 3D models there, you can say that we still have a, a different kind of representations we have different network structures. It's so difficult to say which one will be the best or which one is better than others. So it's still unknown whether there are some efficient representations or some backbone networks can be used for different uh, ship analysis or ship generation tasks there. And another question, open question is that, I'm not sure whether there is a unified latent space for that can encode both the shape's geometry and the layer topology, as well as layer structures in one unified latent space, which means we can use one single network to learn all the properties of the shapes and can get this really good latent code for, for all these properties there. I'm not sure whether there is, or we should try to develop different networks for different properties there. And uh, finally, I would like to thank my collaborators and Peter Pierce, 
Xiaoguang Han, Kui Jia from the universities, and my colleagues and interns, and, uh, and for their uh, contributions for, for all these projects there. And uh, the source code and data for all these three projects I present in my, my talks are available uh, in the GitHub, and you can visit their GitHub web page for all the data, training the model, source code, and feel free to try and, and develop your own algorithm based on that. And that's my talk, and uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Tom, for the, for the wonderful talk. So what we will do here is that we will have an uh, extended Q&A session. So I will start with a few questions that are raised by the audience from the um, uh, YouTube. And I think, uh, so there are qu uh, quite a few, then we'll open questions to the panel. Uh, so by the way, we have two uh, very, uh, well-known panelists. Uh, it's uh, Hao Su from UCSD and uh, um, Xiao Weizhou from Zhejiang University. So they will join and to ask questions and we'll, and if your time permits, we'll have some question, uh, some, some open questions to discuss with uh, uh, Dr. Tom. So, so there are a few questions. Um, one question is that pretty good result. I, I'm wondering how much it relies on good service and sanitations. I, I guess this is related to maybe the third uh, part of your talk. Uh, you mean the, 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 the projection game paper, right? Yeah. And the same, uh, I guess it related to the first or maybe the second part, uh, second work. You mean the second so part? Whether, whether it relies on good share rates and segmentation for training. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. So let, let, me, let me show this part. I think the, uh, something is wrong. Let me try to, let me try to, I, I just stop share and maybe I go back to, to my share. So okay. You, you can, you can and then I can, I can show my, so, so actually our approach, I think, uh, 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 I think our method is relatively robust to the to the silhouette information here, and the accuracy about the silhouette. The, there are two uh, reasons. One is that actually when we do this uh, uh, 3D shape reconstruction uh, generation, uh, the current volume we use here is the resolution is relatively low, so that. And we are not, uh, I mean, the, 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 they are tolerate some kind of inaccuracy about the silhouette. And the second thing is that we, we just use the uh, discriminators and use as a, as, a, as a loss functions. So which means if you un have only small errors or noise about uh, along the silhouette boundaries and that will not uh, make a lot of sad, uh, negative effect to the final result here. And of course, if, you, if, you, if your silhouette is really not uh, good for a lot of 3D shapes, the final result definitely will, will be wrong. And currently for the real image, we just use the automatic segmentation algorithms developed by the deep learning approach. We just uh, don't do any fine tune. We just directly use that to segment the image and use that as a for our training for the real data results. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, so second question is: uh, Have you tried the other skeleton representation, such as L1 median axis, which is usually only formed as lines instead of surfaces, as shown in this work? Right. So this is related to your first work. Yeah, a uh, 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 good question. So so we actually we, we, we don't try this. I I think I think the the the, the I think first it's possible to to use a mixed axis or other skeleton representations to do this. And uh, for, for this one, and when we train this network, we also try to first uh, uh, develop another algorithm to cluster all the points on the skeleton and to some uh, uh, lines and, and she's there, and then based on this plan and the point, uh, 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 sorry, line representations, we, we develop our loss functions to train this uh, skeleton uh, 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 
regression network layer. So for, for mixed uh, media access, I think we can follow the same way to train this. I, I think it should work. The, another question is, um, in terms of learning good shape spaces, do you think it's more promising to learn from annotated 3D data or learn from unsupervised uh, 2D images? Because images are more, right? But the uh, shapes are uh, definitely there, there in 3D. Uh, how can I say? So, 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 so I, I, my, my understanding here is that uh, as I mentioned in the in talks, I think the skill is very difficult for us to to obtain a large amount of the three uh, D models. And uh, when we can get um, one million of the three D models, I believe that we can get a uh, uh, one magnitude more amount of the two D image layer, right? So so I believe that the, the, the finally. I believe that it, it, it should be the solution layer that we can directly learn the 3D space uh, or the 3D representations based on the 2D image layer. I think that's, a, for me, it's a, it's a promising way and uh, probably it will finally solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so the last question from the audience uh, is that in terms of 3D data set, what do you think is the actually missing on the current one? Do you think like we so, Either like we need to make it bigger or like we need to add more annotations. Like, so what is really the the missing piece here, right? In terms of the three data set. I, 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 for, for me, I think the, we, we, we missing a lot. First, I think the compared to the image data set layer, I think the coverage is, uh, is still missing. I mean, if we, if we look at the current 3D shape collections, if we say the number of categories and compared to the real world objects layer, I think there's still a lot of real objects layer or categories are not in our 3D shape collections still. And uh, if we look at a single uh, shape category here, I think the, the amount of the data we, we, we can obtain for each shape category is still missing. I mean, so for example, I, I, I always ask my que one question to my, to my team members is that, Suppose we only focus on the chair category or chair data set. So can anyone tell me how many 3D chairs is good enough so that we can learn a good model late in the space so that we can model any chairs, uh, good chairs in the world, right? Available in the world. So do you need 1 million chairs, 3D samples, or do you need only 10,000 of chairs there? There are no answers there, right? So, so even for one category, I think it's, it's valuable if we can capture or obtain a large amount of chair example, for example, so that we have some understanding about even for this single category, how many data is good enough for us to learn this 3D latent space for one category layer. Then we may can also look at how we extend this one to more uh, categories or more general 3D shapes layer. Yeah. So okay. I think both are missing and both are important. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So then we open questions to the panelists. Maybe start with Dr. Su. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I really enjoyed the uh, uh, very insightful and, uh, uh, talk on the rich set of problems. So, so um, I, I think that I learned a lot from the talk. But uh, so I also want to bring up about a certain you know, small set of uh, problems that we can discuss. Some are a little bit of philosophical. You know? I think they are like deep, difficult problems. Maybe I just want to uh, bring them up and we discuss. So a very first question I'm thinking about is, uh, you know, um, people like to see those um, uh, beautiful pictures mm -hmm. of uh, like reconstructed shapes. <clears throat> On the other hand, yes, uh, so yeah, so a lot of people think that okay, for example, for three reconstruction, now mesh is the um, uh, it's, it's the next thing to do, for example, or or it's like the cutting edge. Well, I agree that um, building very precise models is interesting. Mm -hmm. One puzzle in my mind is um, I think the shape has a like a structure problem and a geometry problem. Mm -hmm. Right, and for the structure problem. Your work for skeleton gives us uh, some mm -hmm. uh, 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 promising direction, and the other work about like the cuboid 
assembly. Mm -hmm. This is a, mm -hmm. this is a very uh, good work. Um, yeah. But I think uh, from this distinction of the structure and the geometry, mm -hmm. there will be a number of very challenging uh, math and philosophical problems. One is what should be a proper boundary between you know, the like, high level abstract structure and the low level geometry? Mm -hmm. uh, this is question one. Mm -hmm. A second question is that I, I, I want to discuss is um, it's like a, because there is the discrete aspect of the problem and also the continuous aspect. Yes. yes. Optimization is often a problem. You know, yes, yes. Optimization, yeah, a lot of times it's hard to overcome yes. local minimums. Yes. Like when, yes. in the work that I did for inferring the <clears> structure in terms of cuboid from a collection of shapes, yeah. I often get stuck in local minimums. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. so do you have insights to like this uh, local minimum? Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe let's start discussion over two problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. The boundary yeah. between structure and the local geometry. Yeah. And the second is like, uh, how do we overcome local minimums in shape and structure? In terms of structure? Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so for me, I think the. I think you 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 raise a really two good good questions. Frank say I I I don't have how can I say complete answers for that. So we can discuss about that. So my current thinking is that for the structure and the geometry details here, I I, I guess the I, I agree with you the boundary between them most likely is the we, we don't have clear boundary between them. There's some weird boundaries here. And just because the structure, the definition of the structure. It's not clear definitions there. Many time, many for many many things or many objects, the structure is defined by the functionality of the of the object, and mm -hmm. it's defined by some semantic meanings of the of the things there. It's not totally defined by the geometry. Mm -hmm. So, which means after we have these definitions there, and according to that definition, always you you can I mean for each kind of object. By the semantic meaning, you can define a clearly structured layer, but then based on that structures, you can also gradually add more and more geometry detail or variations layer. Then the things layer is that for those geometry variations, you add more and more. Then people will ask whether we should put it in some, uh, some, some geometry details or we should put it in some structures. That's why when we develop some structure hierarchy layer, so I think there are some hierarchy of the structures there. So which means as a high level, if you put the high level structure as a structures, then all the following part and be, I mean down detailed part of the structures, you can also regard it as some geometries here. But however, the problem is that whether there are some continuous variations, if we regard it as a geometry, that's a problem. So, so I mean, for me, it's a, there are two kind of definition about, about this boundary. One is that from semantic meaning, is that whether semantically we think it's a structure or the geometry. But that boundary is, is blurred. It depends on different people have different understanding and for different purpose, you have different definition. And mathematically, we can also give some clear boundaries that for any variation we think it's continuous, can be continuous variance or change we think it's a geometry variation. We define it as a geometry variation. But for anything we think it can only discrete, discrete uh, deformed or changed, we can define it as a structure definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it, 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 I don't think it's a good definition just because it's defined by itself, right? Defined by its properties. We say any discrete change things, we call it a structure. Any continuous change since we call it the geometry. If we define in this way, I think there are some clear boundary between these two. Yeah, that, that's my my current understanding about about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, maybe we, we the Doctor Zhou, do you do you want to ask yeah. any question? Yeah. Like, so actually, first, uh, I, I would like to ask some additional comments about. Uh, uh, how's first question the the gap yeah. between the abstraction and the yes. and the, the detailed geometry? I, I think uh, I think uh, in my opinion, uh, what we should like uh, 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 research is 
like how to build a unified geometry uh, representation for both the, the abstraction and the detailed geometry. And I think the the hybrid or <laughs> the hierarchical representation should be uh, should be uh, a promising way that we can represent like the 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 the, the high level abstraction like the pose or the size or the uh, layout in uh, of of the parts or the objects and also we can uh, build some uh, more uh, detailed representation to 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 describe the detailed geometry and uh, this these two levels of representation may be uh, used for different tasks like uh, the for for the high level abstraction we can use it like uh, in more like for example in most of the robotics applications like the navigation or the manipulation mm -hmm. or or editing uh, something like that and uh, for the detailed uh, representation we we may uh, use it for like uh, rendering for the graphics applications but i i think the the question uh, needs to be answered is uh, is there any unifying the representation for these two levels of uh, information like uh, both the structured information and also the detailed information yeah so this is my <laughs> my opinion on this yeah. yeah, I agree. And, I I think I, I I also don't have answer. But my my current feeling is that most likely we need some uh, uh how can I say uh hierarchical uh feature layer or the multi level features layer to represent the different properties of the of the three D shapes layer. Right? So maybe we have some high level features or abstract feature to mainly focus on the structure. And we have some detailed feature vectors to represent the geometry details here. And uh, I, 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 I think it's a, at least it's a promising direction we was to try. I'm not sure whether it will be the final unique, final good solutions there. And, but I think definitely it should be some solutions. Yeah. 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 Okay, so do, do, uh, you, do you have more questions, Dr. Su? I, I think the you also ask another question about the discrete optimization. Uh, yeah. and my, my answer is that I actually we, we, we don't have any <laughs> insights here. What yeah. we predict, we, what we our practice here is that, for example, in our tree selection process, what we do is that we first try to get some uh, continuous functions there, then we try to get some, uh, how can I say, some specific constraints and try to Finalize uh, the final final result layer. That will, how can I say, try to see whether we can achieve the better result layer. I mean, instead of directly doing some optimization in some discrete space, we try to first approximate with some continuous space optimization and then finalize, quantize this is some binary solution or discrete solutions here. But frankly to say, we don't have any comparison to say whether this approach is better than others. It just say in, in our current implementation, it uh, works okay, but yeah, 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 yeah. That's a right. Um, I don't know. Practically, maybe maybe it's possible to, for example, um, collect certain like weak priors uh, for yeah. initializing the discrete optimization. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. And that will be very helpful. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Do we have more questions? I don't. Uh, have yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I have I, actually. I have some questions. I think it's a fantastic talk, and uh, uh, I was inspired a lot. So, uh, actually, I have two questions. The first is about uh, the correspondence problem. Actually, the mm -hmm. in the beginning of the talk, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Tom mentioned the, the one of the biggest challenges is the correspondence because if we yeah. can is establish the perfect correspondence between the shapes, then the learning learning this kind of space might maybe much much easier. So, yeah. do you have any comment on how to uh, or is it possible to like uh, uh, learn the space of the shapes and uh, simultane simultaneously solve the correspondence problem, like uh, establish uh -huh. the between the shapes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, actually, actually, I mentioned there are a set of methods here in this field, if you look at the Atlas Net and the recent work from the Tom Concourse's group, 
they do is a, a template-based uh, implicit function solution. So the, the basic idea is that you define a set of primitives or templates here and some basic functions with the fixed number of basic functions. For example, the 100 of the, of the uh, Gaussian fields or sphere or something like that. Then based on that, you just say, I try to use this fixed number of the templates to fit, to fit all the 3D shapes here. And based on this, you can, you can see that just because for this uh, fixed number of templates, you can give some orders here, right? After you, when you use the network to predict the output. Here. So when you match, when you map each shape or fit each shape with these 100 basic functions, then you build some correspondence between the different shapes just because all the shapes, their part will, need, will fit to the, will map to the each uh, same functions, right? So based on this, you build some correspondence. So this yeah. one, I think is very, very, for me, is a very, very interesting research directions, which means they try to learn the shape space by building the correspondence and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, simultaneously. I think this is very, very interesting. And, uh, and the, the, the question here is that it seems that when you have this fixed number of the shape functions or basis functions, on one hand, you can build a relatively okay correspondence between different shapes here. On the other hand, is that uh, the, the, the reconstruction quality is not very high just because you have this rust sub correspondence and because the basis function you use the number of these limited and each function its capability is limited. Always you can got rough reconstruction quality and rough correspondence, but you, you never give the reconstruction the details. Here. So which means you, you got the good correspondence, but you lose some uh, geometry accuracy. Here. And, uh, and that's one question problem. The another one is that just because we don't have a semantic uh, meaning or semantic correspondence here, and uh, just because we have the different shape structures, so for different uh, shapes with the different structures there, how to build their correspondence, I think it's a, I, I, I don't have any idea how to achieve this. If we have some intermediate shapes there can, can help you to build correspondence gradually, I think it's okay. But the problem is that if we don't have dense enough samples and we don't have intermediate shape structures can build the connection between these two, and then we have no idea how to build the correspondence. People can define different kinds of correspondence there, right? Even you have semantic meaning to build correspondence, I don't think the, 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 the network can automatically learn this correspondence from the unlabeled data. That's also the problem there is that how far away we can achieve, we, we can go. And if we, we, if we based on this approach and, 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 and based on the unlabeled data and based on the self-supervised learning, and if I have dense enough data, I believe that this will give us good enough result. But if we don't have, I'm not sure whether we can achieve really good result or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how do you have additional questions? Mm -hmm. So you're muted. Yeah, but I, I still have one last mm -hmm. question and I think yeah. it's uh, interesting. So how shall we evaluate the progress? I think this is important because somehow today our research is partially driven by the vendors. <clears throat> um, one possibility is through, for example, the reconstruction errors. But uh, if we also believe that, uh, or also think that the, 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 the structure of the shape is actually task dependent, like uh, you need to think about the task, uh, to design structure, then evaluating the structure of the shape should also be a task dependent. Yeah. yeah. But I think that this is a, a completely <laughs> empty space in our, uh, yeah, in our uh, 3D uh, reconstruction. So, mm -hmm. do you have any comments? Oh, I, 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 I thought about it. I think there's several things. One is that as you mentioned, actually, you, you, you ever mentioned earlier is that currently we have some numerical error to, to measure the geometry loss about reconstruction, right? But however, we don't have any measurement or metric to measure the, the topology loss or the structure loss there, right? Well, that's one thing. 
And the second thing is that the, the, the geometry loss we use to measure the reconstruction actually is not consistent with the people's perception loss right. or the people right. evaluations there, right? So sometimes right. I always mention that when you scan an object, for example, cup here, right? So for a lot of applications for, for, for common people, they don't hope that they don't care about one millimeter uh, noise or loss there. They just want the recovery the shape is smooth, right? It's still a cup, it's good. Although you think, oh, the diameter still have one meter, one millimeter law uh, error. People say, I don't care about it, right? But I need that it's a smooth cup shape, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, something I think that it's, I have no idea the, what the error we should define the layer to, to evaluate the result layer. Another thing I'm interested in is that I'm thinking about whether it's possible is that currently just people use a whole, uh, for example, data for the training model, right? They just predict some new result. So I'm thinking is that whether we can do another experiment to say, we use the full data to train a model, right? But if we use, only use the half of the model, half size of the model to train, a uh, size of the data to train the model, then we just use that one to predict another half, whether you think you can still get a good result. Then we just cut the data more with a one third. Then we compare different network or structures or things, say which one can preserve the quality with the minimal number of data. So that one I think should be the better one to, mm -hmm. to, to get the better encode the shape space layer, right? right? right. That may be another test that we can develop layer to evaluate the different models there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Okay, so okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so maybe maybe uh, we can close the Q&A by, uh, so I, I would like to ask a very general question. So in terms of the big picture, okay. So I think uh, um, so this space, like computer graphics, geometrical modeling, geometry processing, I think have uh, we searched uh, several decades, right? Starting from the, the 70s, 80s, like geometric modeling to recent, like this kind of uh, uh, deep learning based approaches, right? So um, so my question to all the three experts here, right? So is that how much do you think this kind of a deep learning um, era can push the field of geometry processing graphics further, right? So what are the problems that Previously, they, they were very hard to solve, and now it becomes easy. And what are the problems like that the, the previously hard to solve right, right now is still hard to solve? Okay, because if you look at if we look at what uh, the found the, the advances in geometry processing, the, the geometrical representations, right? This part of advancement, from my personal perspective, is not that much, right? So I think all the techniques, right? In particular, if we throw over the deep learning representation how we manipulate geometry. I think there, there are many things we have not used, but for the existing ones, they're built upon like previous uh, published papers, okay? Okay, so I throw this question to you. I think we have time, right? So I think this is very interesting. Maybe something from Xintong, yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm not the, frankly say, I'm not the, uh, I haven't done geometry processing for many years, I only, start to learn the geometry processing things from my colleagues here. I start some part of my research on geometry learning about yeah. uh, uh, five or 10 years ago. And uh, my, my feeling is that first for some traditional such as uh, computer aided design or some manufacturing things, I think uh, their numerical approach or some mathematical foundations is still there. And people so care about the accuracy, some, some, some things there. So I, I believe the deep learning will not uh, affect a lot in, in that area. But for mm -hmm. other areas, such as the common people, a lot of applications there, I believe that deep learning will affect a lot. Actually, the key question is that for a lot of applications, if you only care about the final image result, the question even be, do you still need the geometry or you can got a shortcut to use again or some models to generate the image from the image itself without any 3D representations there. That's some questions we may ask. But on the other hand, I believe that for robotics or other things, we definitely can find more applications that the 3D is a must and, uh, and uh, you need the deep learning to, to gather new 
tools or techniques there to enable such applications. That's my 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 understanding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe Xiao Wei, you go first and uh, go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, I think uh, I, I'm uh, I'm excited about uh, the recent the recent advance in like uh, using uh, the uh, the deep implicit representations and uh, as well as the neural rendering for the three D reconstruction or view synthesis problems because I think uh, it provides a very flexible and uh, uh, flexible and uh, efficient way to to represent. Uh, geometry and uh, also it can like represents the, the appearance and the ge geometry in a unified uh, representation and uh, and the both of them can be optimized together uh, like in an end to end way from just from the image observations. I think this this makes me excited and uh, I think it will uh, it will push the the the, the both the three D vision and also like. The, the graphics community, like the inverse rendering problem, to solve inverse rendering problems. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I, I think there are also uh, many, like uh, many challenges uh, that cannot be solved uh, by uh, right now by these methods. Like, uh, uh, for example, how to how to edit or how to like how to how to uh, build a uh, 3D 3D model that can be used in different tasks like uh, in robotics, in graphics, and uh, we can edit it, we can visualize it, and uh, uh, we can uh, yeah. So so I mean, how to uh, build a model that that is uh, that that includes both the semantics information, the appearance, and the like functionality is. Uh, from the from the from the data from the image data or other real world data, I think it's still very challenging. How how do you uh okay uh do you want to uh close the session the with your thoughts on the on, the, on this kind of big picture? Okay, okay, yeah. Well, this is a big picture question. I mean. It gives us certain imagination in retrospections our past efforts. So what the question about like uh, deep learning versus shape understanding. First of all, I feel that deep learning itself is making progress. Right? The deep learning itself is not like a, um, a already quite a mature and um, uh, like stopped area. Like for example, um, before we, we have the NLP, we have this convolutional neural network, and later we have the bridges for processing point cloud, uh, which gives you a continuous embedding space. And then there's the implicit function, which actually also encodes the continuity of the shape circuit itself. Right. So I think that from these kind of aspects, mm -hmm. by categorizing those like, kind of continuous aspects of shapes, I feel that I mean, like we may have made good progress. Either the continuous embedding shapes or the continuity of the surface itself. Maybe you have made good aspect of progress. On the other hand, for uh, for shapes, right, there is also the structure aspect. It's kind of like the shape grammar, shape DNA. So for the grammatical aspects, um, I feel that um, the deep learning community is making good progress recently. Like in, in, in including the graph neural networks, including the very latest, uh, uh, um, like uh, the influential result of the GPT-3, right? That uses the transformers kind of architecture that seems to be able to infer certain reason and even algorithm procedure. I don't know. I think that for this kind of uh, achievements, um, <clears throat> there should be certain 3D problems that have similar flavors. Yeah, so I feel that for that part, uh, the shape problem could actually drive the progress of deep learning. It's not simply to uh, adopt. <laughs> yeah, so, right. Yeah, so, so that is uh, my general thought.
And I think that uh, for shape, right, we work a lot on the synthesis problem. This is a uh, creation. The creation has a certain rationale and logic behind it. That is encoded as certain rules or grammars of certain ways. So I mean, if we have, how do we use deep learning to, to correctly encode this aspect? I feel that's, uh, yeah, that's, that could be something that we consider next step. <laughs> Okay, so thanks for all for your for your uh, for your for first of all uh, Tong Xin's uh, wonderful talk and for all the comments and for the panelists all the comments during this Q and A session and so uh, so we will continue next Wednesday and to Europe and Michael Bornstein will give the the, the first uh, seminar talk. Okay, thank you all for attention. Bye bye. Thank you.